We are back at it. And today I want to discuss how blind we are as a people and as a nation. We are very blind. We're groping, trying to find the wall. Now, this is the reason why Jesus recommends us to receive I saw. We need something to help us see because there are things that are right in our face, right up under our nose. The truth is right before your eyes and you can't ignore it. Now, one thing the church world is blind to, Israelite camps are blind to, even this whole nation is blind to the fact that Paul is the wolf in sheep clothing. Now, across seas, in the nation of Islam, they know Paul is a wolf in sheep clothing. They know he is a false apostle. They get this. How come we have issues understanding that Paul is the wolf in sheep clothing? I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Who is the wolf in sheep clothing Jesus warned about? Now, Jesus said, beware. He says, beware more than anybody. And this, I believe, is going into a dog. Backwards is God. This is going into a wolf. He's telling you, beware of wolves in sheep clothing. Someone who would be from us. And we know that Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin, which is the southern kingdom. He was one of us. Paul was like the scar who betrayed the father. Okay, and he is responsible for the false murder of Simba, of the prophet Isa, peace be upon him. Okay, use your mind, open up. The truth is right in our eyes, in our face every day. The truth is right in our face every day. Now, Jesus did not get along with the Pharisees. Is that true? I'm asking the Christians questions. Did Jesus and the Pharisees get along? I'm sure you will say no. Well, then how come the last messenger for the Christians was a Pharisee? He was the son of a Pharisee. Who is the wolf in sheep clothing that Jesus was warning us of? This could only be Paul. Now, Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin. The symbol is the ravening wolf. Okay, that is seen in Genesis 49. This is the very basics. Okay, I'm giving you. Who else could be the wolf in sheep clothing? Who would come on the scene after him? This right here, my friend, is one thing that the church world is blind to and Israelite camps are. The black man is blind to Paul being the wolf in sheep clothing. Okay, I just had to put that out there. Okay, I don't even think I've ever met a black man who ever told me or even talked. Or, or even teach or even talk about Paul being the wolf in sheep clothing. I've only heard white men and Muslim men expose Paul as the wolf in sheep clothing, but not the black man. The black man, for the most part, that is interested in spirituality, for the most part, except Paul. Now, there are some who claim to be Israel and they don't agree with the New Testament, okay. Some of them don't, okay. But for the most part, the black man loves Paul. This is one thing that trips me out, especially when I go over all these passages where Jesus is constantly saying, beware, beware, beware. And you only say beware to a dog. You only say beware to the Pharisees. This is going to be Matthew 16 and 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. 
He's telling you to beware of the Pharisees. Paul was a Pharisee. We know that this leaven is going into yeast and he's not talking about bread. He's talking about the teaching of Jesus being resurrected, to be quite simple. That's another thing I don't understand. Why are we so blind to this? Why are we so blind? Matthew chapter 16 is talking about the leaven of the Pharisees, and it can only mean the teaching that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now, what explanation you have? What else could be the leaven of the Pharisees? Paul was a Pharisee, and he talked about the resurrection. We know that David told us in the book of Samuel that can't nobody come back from the dead. This was King Saul's problem when he inquired of Samuel and he was deceived by a familiar spirit. Okay, he did not bring back Samuel from the dead. King Saul wanted to bring back a dead prophet and Paul did the same thing with the prophet Esau. Peace be upon him. So what else could be the leaven of the Pharisees? You tell me. You tell me what is the leaven of the Pharisees? Jesus said it's a doctrine. What is the teaching of the Pharisees today? Christianity. He was telling you to beware of a religion coming in the future called Christianity. Now let's get some more of these bewares from the prophet Esau, peace be upon him. This is going to be Mark 12 and 38. And he said unto them in his doctrine, beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces. He's given you a picture of the apostate, the self-proclaimed apostle Paul. He's pointing you to Paul, the wolf in sheep clothing. And you're just so blind, you just don't get it. You just don't get it. This right here literally boggles me, okay, that the Christian church don't understand that Paul was the wolf in sheep clothing. And then he's telling you to beware of the Pharisees all the time. And then we have an apostate come along who was the son of a Pharisee by the name of Paul, and now he took over the church. The church was taken over by a Pharisee, but he's warning you about Pharisees. He's not getting along with Pharisees, and now a Pharisee pops up. Then Jesus, in the book of Revelation, talks about a false apostle. He doesn't mention Paul's name. He doesn't congratulate Paul for doing a good job being the only person to tell us all that Christ died for our sins. Paul gets no pat on the back. He goes on to expose a false teacher who's teaching the church to eat food sacrificed to idols. Now, amazingly, who is the only teacher in the Bible? who teaches the church that they could eat food sacrificed to idols. It was Paul. They had an agreement in the book of Acts, but Paul broke it. Now he's saying nothing's unclean and you can eat what you want to eat. An idol is nothing and just don't offend your brother. This man is the biggest hypocrite, okay? When Jesus was constantly getting on hypocrites, he was getting on Paul. This trips me out how the church still has not found out yet that Paul is the wolf in sheep clothing. Now, I'm just sharing my thoughts with y'all. These are the things that I think about on a day to day basis. I wonder why the church is so blind. I wonder why they do not see. Paul, the wolf in sheep clothing. I wonder why they don't see the prophet Muhammad, which is mentioned by name in Song of Solomon 516. They make excuses about his name being there and they bring up desire and Mahmoud and all this stuff. But his name is in the original Hebrew translation. 
Muhammad them with a plural of respect in the book of Song of Solomon. Now Solomon is significant because Solomon gave us the prayer direction. The Bini Israel would have to pray facing Solomon's temple. And there came a man in the future who would give us a prayer direction. His name is the prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. I wonder why the church is so blind. They don't get that. Like, that is just so simple. Okay? It literally makes me believe that these people just don't want to live a righteous, godly life. Because they know the prophet Muhammad is in the Bible, but they just make excuses. Okay? So they can lead their lifestyle of sin. That's the only plausible explanation for people ignoring how the prophet Muhammad is seen in the book of Song of Solomon, uh, his hair color, okay, his skin color, the shape of his nose, <laughs> his exploit with the 10,000, okay, in Mecca 629 CE, which is referenced in Deuteronomy 33 and 2. Okay, it even goes on to bring out that he is beloved. Now, beloved means David, and David means beloved. And there are amazing similarities in between David and the prophet Muhammad. They both hid in caves. Okay, they both were in Arabia. David was in Arabia. Okay, there's so much in the lifestyle of David and the prophet Muhammad. Okay, I can see it. And I wonder why the church do not see this. Get this now. David was famous for the 10,000. When the women sung that song, when they mentioned the 10,000 being with David, it made Saul jealous. Okay, now think about the New Testament Saul. He was the one who cursed the nation of Islam in Galatians 1 and 8. So now we understand why the 10,000 made him jealous because there was only one man of history who showed up in Arabia, in Mecca, 629 CE, with 10,000 converts, the prophet Mohammed. This is the reason why Saul eyed David. Okay, Saul saw. He seen David. He was jealous of David. Okay. And the apostate Paul was jealous of the true prophet, the prophet Muhammad. It amazes me how the Christians do not see this. Now let's keep going on. Solomon married more women than anybody in the Bible. Okay. Over a thousand. Now the prophet Muhammad is the only prophet who was told that he could legally marry as many women as he wanted. Now, even Solomon and David and all the kings of Israel were in disobedience when they married many women. Why? Because the king of Judah, the king of Israel, was not supposed to multiply wives to himself. He was supposed to keep a limited number. Okay, he's supposed to just keep a few of them, okay? Although the children of Israel, okay, were given an unlimited amount of women they could marry, long as they could take care of them. There was no limits on how many women a man could marry. The only ones who were forbidden to marry a whole bunch of women were the kings of Israel, and they still did the opposite, okay? They married more wives because they could take care of them. A lot of the Israelites did not make enough money to be able to take care of multiple women. But we see that Samuel's dad, he was a dad that had multiple wives. Samuel was a righteous man and his dad had two wives. And this man had perfect balance with women. He loved the woman that was hated. He loved the woman that was barren, okay? He gives us profound, deep insight 
on the character of God. Okay? He says something like this. Am I not better to you than ten sons? He told his wife Hannah that when she was barren. And she was sad because she wanted a son. And he popped up like the father and said, am I not better than ten sons? In other words, isn't God better than a billion sons? Okay? God is more important than any son or any daughter. Like the Christians have made him nobody. They literally reduced him to a nothing. They literally reduced God the Father to a homer. Okay, and when I speak Father, I speak the Father of lights. Okay, the creator of the world who has no sons. Now this man, Elkanah, that was his name. This man knew how to love two women. It can be done. Okay, it wasn't against the law. Paul was the one who showed up in the New Testament and he said, looky here, a man can't have more than one woman. And then he said something which was already common knowledge. He tells us that a woman can only have one man. Well, duh. Okay, a man is made in the image of God so he can have multiple spouses. But a woman is not so. A woman can only have one man because that is a picture of what we call true monotheism because we all can only have one God. So there's a whole lot of revelation in the very fact that men are allowed to marry multiple wives and women are not. OK, so Paul was the one who came on the scene and changed that. OK, Paul's letters are like the skinny cows that devoured the fat flesh cows. His New Testament destroyed the Old Testament. OK, that's exactly what the teachings of Paul have done. And that's why the teachings of Paul is going to be there to the end. It's not going nowhere. Christianity is going to be faithful all the way to the end until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes Jesus to die a natural death. And after Jesus, of course, destroys the cross, when he goes on to that natural death, when Allah closes his eyes, whoo, the church is going to be done. Christianity is going to be over with. But right now, it is the master of all religions on planet Earth. It's like the sword of Ammon, okay? Ammon, that actually means teacher, okay? Paul's letters are considered the best teaching in the world right now. Islam is about to debunk that. Islam right now, it's on its way, is on its way to being number one. So those are things that I think about and I'm like, wow, the church is so blind. Also, the church is so blind that they don't understand that the killing of the firstborn of Egypt is a picture of Jesus Christ, which is the firstborn of Egypt. He's going to die in the future. Why? Because Joseph was a picture of Christ. Joseph was an Egyptian. OK, and Joseph was a picture of Christ. And at the last day, God is going to let loose the final plague. And that is going to be the killing of the prophet Isa, which the Quran tells us about. OK, the Quran is the truest book. The Hadiths are the truest revelation known to mankind on planet Earth. It tells us the perfect balance of the killing of the firstborn. It is the last plague, not the first plague, Paul. Okay? It's not something that has happened already. The killing of the firstborn was the last plague God did upon Pharaoh. And after that, they were done. Okay? The Egyptians were done. And that's the same thing. That God is going to do to the Christian church. He's going to do the same thing that he did to the Pharaoh in the past. He's going to kill Pharaoh's son. Now we know that Pharaoh is a picture of Paul. God is going to kill Paul's son. Okay, keep in mind, Paul called himself the father. 
Even in Islam, Muhammad is told he's not the father. Even Jesus said, call no man your father. Okay, but Paul took it upon himself to be the father because he is the Pharaoh. He is the most powerful man on planet Earth. Paul was the most powerful man on planet Earth. He was the father of Jesus. He made Jesus the Lord of his church. He put Jesus in a predicament where he has to be the lamb that will be slain at the last day. Okay, the church has failed to recognize Paul in the story of Cain killing Abel. They failed to recognize Paul in the life of Pharaoh, in the life of Potiphar, in the life of Holofernes, in the life of the Pharisees. Paul is the man with the fur. He is the man that proclaimed to be the father. So I'm going to keep talking about things that trip me out that the church don't see. I'm going to continue to talk about how blind we are as a nation of people. Christians are very, very blind. They're in my comments right now talking about Jesus is God. And that's nowhere in the Bible. Okay, the Bible says the opposite. It says Jesus of Nazareth is a man. The Bible says the opposite. The Bible says God is not a man. And if the Antichrist appears, they believe in Christianity that the Antichrist will be a human being proclaiming to be God. Well, where does that fuel come from? That fuel comes from the Christians because they believe that Jesus is God. They believe a man is God. And by doing so, they are of the Antichrist, okay? Because it only makes sense that God is not a man. So therefore, he can't be confused with anybody because he's not a human being. But the Christians, they are of the Antichrist because they are the ones who are opening up the door for the Antichrist to come because they already believe Jesus is God. And when you believe a human being is God. You open up the door for the Antichrist. The Muslims have it right. We acknowledge Jesus come in the flesh. In other words, he's a human being. But the Antichrist, the Pharisees, the Christians, they believe Jesus is God. So therefore, they open up the door for deception. A man, you want to know what's their problem? They're under the spell. The Christians are under witchcraft. And I'm going to leave you with this. I want you to go to your Bible app, type in witchcraft, okay? The first person that is going to pop up is Saul. Now, go to the New Testament. The last time witchcraft is going to pop up is with the New Testament, Saul. Christianity is witchcraft, and there's coming a day that we will uphold the law of Moses, we will not suffer a witch to live. Assalamu alaikum to my brothers and sisters in the truth.